the audience is so niche for the for the Steam Deck. It's for people who play PC games and want to play those games portably and already have a big high-end PC and then want to spend money on this other relatively high-end uh, handheld and big, powerful, beefy handheld. But my opinion's changed since I've gotten Ooh, it and been playing it for a that's while. That's spicy. Uh, I kind of like it a lot more now than I do. Yeah. Let's get into it. What's good, that gang? Ever since the Steam Deck was announced, people have wanted to compare it to the Nintendo Switch, myself included to some extent. This was also a clear-cut way for content creators to get a ton of views on a video before the Steam Deck launch. I didn't jump on this trend. Not because I wasn't willing to clout chase for views. I'm happy to do that. Uh, I mean, again, we make Steam Deck videos. Clout is what you're saying. Huh? A clout chaser is what you're saying. You're, you're, you're chasing the clout. No, I didn't jump on this trend because I didn't feel like I had anything significant to say on this subject. Some of the Switch versus Steam Deck debate is kind of self-evident, right? Like Steam Deck is clearly more powerful than the Switch and it clearly has a level of flexibility that no Nintendo console ever will. On the other hand, the Steam Deck will never get Nintendo exclusives and when it comes down to it, that's the reason I buy Nintendo consoles. I don't really see myself buying a new Xbox or PlayStation because their games mostly come to PC at this point. And PC is obviously my my preferred platform. The new Mario's, Zelda's, and Metroid's will not make it to PC, emulation notwithstanding. So for me personally, it doesn't matter how powerful a Nintendo console is or isn't, it doesn't matter what features there are, I'm still going to pick up a Nintendo Switch 2 for the Nintendo games. So yeah, the debate was never really a debate for me. I joke about Ditch the Switch and I think the Steam Deck builds on the hybrid revolution that Nintendo started, but generally they're two different entities. And I don't mean that as one has a mainstream audience and one has a niche audience. I think the Steam Deck is super capable of being a mainstream device and that's what I want to talk about today. I eat, sleep, and breathe Steam Deck content, so I've seen almost all of the reviews, including the reviews from more mainstream outlets like Wolfden, Woodhawker, Metal Jesus Rocks, and Kevin Kenson. Shout out to all of those guys. And lately, they've given me a new way to compare the two devices. They've helped me put into words something that I inherently felt but never fully realized, and it's that the Steam Deck grows on you in a way that traditional consoles can't. I've seen this experience time and time again. Initially, people think that the Steam Deck is a cool, but ultimately vestigial addition to their life. But over the course of a few months of use, the possibilities open up. Valve's updates contribute to this too. Just as an example, in Woodhawker's review, he said, The more I played it, the more I found to love them. And so I've compiled a few examples from these mainstream reviewers of how the Steam Deck is growing on them and why I personally think it's a sign of things to come and how I think the Steam Deck can go from being seen as a niche device to being seen as something more mainstream. Additionally, I want to talk about how I think the Steam Deck has some ways to challenge the status quo in console gaming. As we jump in folks, don't forget to like and subscribe if you're new to the channel. I love to talk about the Steam Deck and I make new videos weekly, so if you want to stay up to date, make sure you set your notifications to all. Also, by the way, I almost lost my shit when Bob and Wood were talking about potential Steam Deck YouTubers. Obviously, when the Switch came out, you and I uh, blew up doing Switch content. Do you think there would be a Steam Deck channel that like comes out that, of nowhere and blows up becoming the Steam so Deck guy? I That's funny you say that because I was doing a little bit of research for the video that I was making and I came across a YouTube channel. Uh, God, I forgot the name of it already. I'm right here, guys. I'm right here. I'm the guy. I'm the guy that blew up off Steam Deck content. Also, shout out to Deck Ready, who they did mention. In any case, let's start with something really obvious. The frequency at which Valve is making large updates to the Steam Deck. This was a common theme for reviews, but take a listen to Bob Wolf talk about Valve's updates in his I was wrong about the Steam Deck video. I still have my concerns about the weird little glitches and general unpolishedness of the Steam Deck experience. But like I said before, they're updating it much quicker than I was expecting. The thing I want you to remember from that is how he said that Valve has worked on this more than he expected to. I wanna come back to that. 
Before that, you could argue that the Steam Deck shouldn't have needed all of these updates. You could argue that the Steam Deck launched in an unfinished state, and I think that's a reasonable thing to say. However, Valve updates have not just been a matter of bug fixes and obviously missing functionality. There's also been stuff like adjustable refresh rates, better remote play together, and performance profiles. These are huge, significant updates that we're not used to seeing on such a regular basis. That's why someone like Bob can say Valve are working on this more than he expected them to, because our expectations have been shaped by Sony, Microsoft, and Nintendo, whose operating systems will stay mostly the same for a given console generation. It's rare that you'll see a big sweeping change like when Xbox 360 went from a Blades dashboard to the NXE dashboard. And while the Steam Deck interface has remained largely the same, they have been pushing significant changes and show no real signs of slowing. Moreover, Valve have talked about getting their operating system to work on PCs more broadly, so I think that's more evidence that SteamOS is something that people will get used to as time goes on. It's unfamiliar to many at first, but in time, SteamOS grows on you. And that brings me to the flexibility of SteamOS, which can be a gift and a curse, but again, only point to the longevity of this device. First, let's go to this clip from the Woodhawker review for the gift of flexibility. So there's one thing that I love about the Steam Deck that it had day one looking at you, Nintendo Switch. That's right, Bluetooth. The reason why having... Now that was part of an ad for the Raycons, so I guess maybe take it with a grain of salt, but the point was still salient, right? For example, I am so frustrated that the PlayStation 5 still does not support Bluetooth audio. What is the reason? And yeah, like he mentioned, Nintendo Switch only somewhat recently started supporting Bluetooth audio. That should have been available out of the box. This flexibility extends well past audio, of course. You can use a whole host of controllers with the Steam Deck. DualSense, no problem. DualShock, knock yourself out. Switch Pro, go for it. The freaking Wavebird? Spread your wings and fly, my friends. Not to mention keyboards, mice, additional storage. I mean, it's a PC. It would almost be easier to list the things that would not work with it. The level of flexibility comes with a flip side. Here's Woodhawker in the same review struggling to understand that EXEs don't just launch in Linux. What am I, what am I doing wrong? I'm not this dumb. Open the .exe. What do you want to do with this file? Execute. Select the program you want to use to open Xbox controller.exe. Oh, hold on. I can't open an exe in Linux. All right, I'm dumb. It actually so this is where people will need time to get acclimated to Linux or really just Steam OS. As time goes on, I have a hunch that people will stop mentioning that it's Linux and just refer to it as Steam OS. In any case, my point is this is uncharted territory for many people. They need some time to live in Steam OS and learn how to navigate it. But once they're in, it'll be hard to go back to a world where you have to buy a special wireless headset to go with your console or a world where they force you to buy the new controller even though the old one would work just fine. Here's something I found funny well before there were reviews of the Steam Deck. At the time, a lot of the people who loved the Switch but would denounce the Steam Deck would on the one hand bemoan the size of the Steam Deck, but on the other hand praise grips or alternative Joy-Cons like the Hori Split Pad Pro for the Switch. I never understood that. I think the Hori Split Pad Pro is a great idea. The Switch is genuinely uncomfortable for me to hold in my hands for long sessions. And in watching these reviews, I noticed that most of these folks had grips for their Switches, just like I do. Kevin Kenson addressed it and the relative comfort of a naked deck here. This is something that's been complained about with the Switch a lot, where oftentimes people find themselves having to buy special grip designs or buying third-party Joy-Con designs in order to make for a larger, more comfortable grip to use the system over long periods of time. I think when people see a Steam Deck, it kind of looks ridiculous and unwieldy, even in person. In this clip from Wood, he's astonished at how huge his deck is. It's massive. I can't help but really look at the size of this thing. But once he picks it up, all of that seems to melt away. Oh, oh hold up a minute. It's actually super light. It is way, way lighter than I expected. That's actually really... While many do compliment the comfort of the controls, I would be remiss if I didn't call out that many of these reviewers were also confused a bit by the layout. Because of the space the touchpads take, the D-pad and buttons are all in line with the analog sticks, which is pretty unlike any other control pad. Here's Kevin Kenson talking about it. Where whenever I'm using my Steam Deck, I'm basically always going to the touchpad first, expecting to use D-pad controls, and nope, that's the touchpad. And in some games that works out okay, and in other games, those don't do the same thing at all, and yeah, that's a problem. 
I can absolutely see how this could be a problem for people, and this is something to get used to for sure, but it's not like using a GameCube controller or an N64 controller for the first time. I think this is something that people can adapt to relatively quickly. What may take a lot more time to get used to, however, are the touchpads. Bob Wolf was not a fan of the touchpads at all, but I think Wood Hawker has sort of the right idea when it came to getting acclimated to them. Essentially acts not only as the D-pad and as toggles, but also uh, it's touch, it's, it's mouse. You can use it as a mouse. So I downloaded Sims 4. I'm you. It's lit. It just becomes a mouse. It's super pinpoint and sensitive. I can very easily delete a wall and then build an extension to the house in seconds. Now, is it as easy as a mouse? No, but I've been using a mouse my whole life. I like that way of looking at it. Just like Wood, I've been using a mouse my entire life. Of course, I'm not going to be able to match that level of proficiency on a touchpad. There's just no way. But I'll tell you one thing. I can't go back to aiming with an analog stick. You, you can't make me. And even though I am better with a mouse, I personally prefer to use the touchpad. It's more convenient. It means that I can't always set my sights on the highest scores on the leaderboards of first person parkour games, but it also means that I can play those games in bed. And here's something I was really looking forward to seeing from many people who had doubts about the Steam Deck. When you first get a Steam Deck, it's understandable that the first thing you want to do is try Elden Ring or God of War or Cyberpunk. And the Steam Deck does that really well. But where I think the Steam Deck shines, and even more importantly that Steam as a platform shines, is in the slightly more obscure. The digital stores of the consoles are still all walled gardens. The selection is still pretty limited compared to what Steam affords you. This is notable because the Nintendo Switch sparked a new indie wave, and I think the Steam Deck is capable of doing the same. It's home to hundreds of good indies that are not available in the walled gardens. Kevin Kenson basically made an entire video about the Steam Deck being perfect for indies. Take a look. Indie games though, at least a lot of the ones that I've been playing, the Steam Deck really does leverage the right amount of power to where they're going to play, run, and look beautiful on the system. And there is an entire library of them out there that isn't really anywhere else. This is the sort of thing that's not like a glamorous use case for the Steam Deck. It sounds somewhat unimpressive to say that one of the best things about the Steam Deck is that you can play a bunch of indie games. But it takes time and discovery to realize, yeah, I'm missing out on a huge library of games I didn't even acknowledge existed. And then to go back to something like a Switch, it's kind of hard. Just look at Steam Next Fest. You could reasonably accrue a backlog of great demos to play, just demos. And these are demos that are not available on any console for games that will release on Steam first, even if they do eventually come to a console. A similarly unglamorous use case for the Steam Deck is the ability to play older modern games, specifically games from the PS3 and 360 era, and especially the former where backwards compatibility doesn't exist. On the Steam Deck you can play games from 2005 to 2013 with relative ease. Bayonetta and Metal Gear Rising run like butter. Here's Metal Jesus Rocks talking about this. It's something I, I hadn't really considered before, but I gotta tell you it was very cool to go on there and get some of these games for less than $10, sometimes way less than that, and play them on the Steam Deck. And again, they look fantastic. So again, very unglamorous, but something you get increasingly used to. You're not going to sell any Steam Decks by saying, hey, now you can play Enslaved Odyssey to the West in your hands. But there is something about having almost the entire history of video games playable on one platform. And that brings me to my last point with regard to how the Steam Deck grows on you. Everything about Steam Deck compatibility is relatively confusing at first. I think Valve have done a good job of trying to make this less confusing, but it's a really difficult problem to solve. If I log on to the Check My Deck app, it will tell me that 37% of my Steam library is playable. Many people will see that and infer that 63% of my library is not compatible, and that's absolutely false. I would say that something like 10% of my library is not compatible. The vast majority of games that I try are playable, mostly with no tinkering. And people sort of don't realize that until they just start playing games. This is something I heard throughout a number of these reviews and it's one of the things I'm looking forward to people getting a better understanding of. So let me give you some of my final thoughts here. In all of these videos, the reviewers made a point to say that the Steam Deck is not a Switch killer and it makes no sense to me. I completely agree with that. 
They said that both can coexist, and I completely agree with that too. I think that the Switch and the deck both offer a unique way to look at the other. I think the more people use and get used to a Steam Deck, the more chance there is for disruption in the traditional gaming landscape. On the Steam Deck, I don't have to pay for online or pay for cloud saves, and a remaster has to do a lot to get taken seriously. Thanks to trackpads and Steam input, the Steam Deck is a wonder for accessibility. The lack of a walled garden means that there are a huge amount of exclusives on Steam Deck. Individually, none of those exclusives carry the same weight as a Zelda, but as a collective, it becomes very compelling. And of course, Nintendo is Nintendo. At some point, people are going to count them out just like they did after the GameCube and after the Wii U. But I will never count Nintendo out. Their double-edged sword is that they know how to craft a toy and how to craft experiences that evoke that childlike joy. They don't have to compete in the same space as Microsoft, Sony, or Valve. So no, the Steam Deck will not kill the Switch. And even as the Switch does grow long in the tooth, it continues to sell well. But what I look forward to is seeing people that are a little bit bewildered by the Steam Deck at first, slowly unlock more of its power and slowly become more enamored with it. Over time, Steam Deck can make big waves and I'm anxious for that future. All right, if you enjoyed this video, be sure to like and subscribe. I'm here every week. And if you wanna support what I'm doing, consider joining these fine folks over at Patreon. Deck Gang out. Goodbye.